I would like to introduce our our keynote speaker for this evening, oh, Mark wow. Chagru. I don't think he needs any introduction. Let's see, Mark Chagru, um, ACNO of Professional Services and CNIO at UMass Medical Center. Not bad. Uh, as, as well as a member, and I hope you'll talk about this later, of the North American HIMSS Board of Directors, which is really wonderful to have a nurse on that board yes. and to have you as that nurse. Oh, thank you. More exciting. Yep. And um, Mark has many other accolades, um, but I'll leave those. You, you can Google them. <laughs> no, please <laughs> don't do that. All the interesting ones. But thank you very much. And I really have to say special thanks to Mark because we did have a speaker who was unable to join us at the last minute, and I went to Mark, please. <laughs> and, he said, and, he, all the and he took my hat <laughs> and he said yes. So I, I really would did. never say And that. I like that tie. Thank you. Your Red Sox tie. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm like, team. That's okay. But, that's okay. Yeah. I apologize. So it has just a little. Uh, okay. And if anybody has any issues, you can send us a note. Um, hopefully, you can hear us just on the phone. Here up there. Artie's saying so. Oh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Hi, Artie. <laughs> uh, well, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to try to make this as uh, informal as possible. So I do have a bunch of slides, but I may may not get to them all. <laughs> we'll see how we how we do. But I'd really like to have um, more of a conversation. It's um it's interesting. Mary asked me sort of um, last minute to um to put this together. But as it turns out, Wednesday I'm leaving to go to Washington D.C. for um it's called the Health Management Academy. It's a um, sort of quasi think tank, it's a um, by invitation only group. Uh, Denise Goldsmith and I used to participate in it. It's, um, they only let in um, organizations with a billion dollars in revenue or greater, and it's all C-level, so CNOs, CNIOs, CFOs, and they have different forums. So I'm going to the CNIO forum uh, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday in D.C., and we'll be sitting at a table like this, but with Johns Hopkins, Duke, Sutter, from the great players. And I so, hope you'll think of us and think about people. I will. I, I, I always plug Nina. Every, every, uh, every uh, thing I do, I, I'm always plugging the Nina. So I did borrow some of those slides, and, you know, um, the title that I sort of came up with um, after I talked to Mary and sort of looking at what was originally proposed was sort of beyond the EHR. I mean, we're, we've all been living in this world for so long. It's sometimes nice to sort of think ahead and say, what's next? You know, where, where is this headed? And uh, where are we headed with our nursing informatics? So that's kind of what we're, I'm looking to talk about. Today's my daughter's 25th birthday, so oh, happy oh, birthday, Olivia. October 29th. Is there a delay, Mary, or should I just... Uh, um, you have to hit the little orange arrow on the bottom right-hand corner. You can say that. Okay, this... Oh, where? Up, 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 up there. there. Up, down. down. Right there. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to meet these objectives, but that's what I came up with. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll meet them. Um, and I, I apologize for the uh, eye chat. I'll just explain what this is. So, you know, you, you sort of hit a point in your career where you kind of do the reflection thing, and I think I'm there. Uh, maybe it's because now we have a 25-year-old. Uh, but sort of looking back over the last decade or so and then looking ahead over the next decade, it was really kind of fascinating. The, the orange bar there is the Future Nursing Report. I'm sure many of you know that, right? The 2010 yeah. Consensus Report. Believe it or not, that was written in 2010, right? So, and it projected out, you know, 20 years from there. And you may recall some of what was in there was 80% bachelor's degrees by 2020, increase our number of PhDs, scope of practice, and all that. One of the offshoots of that, though, was HIMSS in 2011 produced a position statement on the role of nursing informatics. And many consider that sort of a pivotal uh, document um, that really helped set the stage for uh, the CNIO role. It really was not existent um, prior to then, at least not in any way, shape, or form. And the 2011 HIMSS position statement, was, if you read it, really um, called for that. It called for leadership, called for nursing informatics. Uh, to be at the table in the uh, in the C-suite and really redefine some of the um, the, the roles of the uh, informatics. So you couple that on top of what else was going on. We all know about the Affordable Care Act, right? That was also sort of in the same uh, time frame. And then meaningful use. As I reflect back on my sort of short career so far, I think in uh, health IT, meaningful use has such an impact that we, you know, I think for most of us around this table, um, when we think back upon uh, what what's happened, right? It was really the incentive, literally the financial incentive, to really 
proliferate the amount of technology that was adopted. And really ever since then, if you look um, where the Meaningful Use Program e ended, sort of in quotations, right, because it's not really over, it's becoming macro now. Mm -hmm. the, the no more incentive money, but the standards and the quality indicators are still going to be there through the MACRA um, program. And if you don't know about that, I'll provide links and whatnot. I could do a whole right. talk just on what, what MACRA is. Um, and then we have this little thing called ICD-10 hanging out there in 2015 as well. But those, those key drivers, if you will, really helped define and shape nursing informatics during this period. And I would argue, I call it the, the you know, if we had a label like we do with the, um, you know, different periods of the world, it was the implementation period, right? We all were so focused and still are in many cases um, on the uh, work of um, implementing systems during the meaningful use um, era. And then as we look ahead, so the right-hand side of the chart, the words that are sort of in gray there are some of the buzzwords that you all know and hear every day, right? It's the Affordable Care Act continuing, whatever that's going to look like. It's accountable care organizations. It's interoperability. Um, these are the things that on the HIMSS board that the HIMSS board of directors looks at to help set the strategy for HIMSS going forward. So I was fortunate to have some sort of fresh um, insights from some of the uh, key folks who helped guide the direction that HIMSS as an organization is heading. And it was really interesting to note that they're really looking at some of what we call the new entrants to healthcare, the Walmarts, the Amazons, I'm sure you've all heard about, you know, Dr. Atul Gawand and what's happening there and the deep investments that are being made outside of your typical brick and mortar buildings and provider spaces, right? So what's that gonna cost? what's that gonna look like for us? Where what's how does where does and how does informatics fit into that? So the post meaningful use era, um, I think we need to think about, you know, as great as meaningful use was, the thing I hated about it was it was the government defining our priorities, right? They they pretty much said you gotta do CPOE, you gotta do barcode medication administration. Most of us were doing that anyway, right? But they said this is what you need to do. And unfortunately it got to that point where you know what, we had to be told what to do because we weren't getting there fast enough. But what what about the future now? What's the role the government gonna play now in directing these investments? And uh, will we continue to uh, make those investments like we have in the past? So we'll talk more about that as we, um, as we go through, but I want you thinking about those things. Um, this is no news to anybody. Uh, Him stage seven is the sort of top, right? That's the um, highest level, and each stage below is sort of a step down or um, a lower adoption of the, um, the HIMS EMR adoption model, MRAM adoption model. And what's been fascinating with this, uh, having, again, seen it over my entire career, there was a point in time where I got many of you around this table remember CPOE was like 5% in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. That there, we were, it was not unusual to see numbers like that next to it. But you can just see, again, going back to that previous chart from 2010 to 2017, <coughs> uh, we've come a long way, baby, right? Uh, put a plug in for UMass. So we went live on our new electronic health record last October 1st. And um, over the summer, we um, designated him stage seven for both the hospital and the ambulatory. So we took a quantum leap at mm -hmm. UMass, one of the last of the uh, leftover <laughs> um, sort of paper, best of breed systems around and really jumped up to the him, him stage seven. But again, what this tells us, right? What does this tell us about the work that we've been doing? We've been implementing, 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 right? Uh, good, bad, and indifferent. That's what we've been doing. That's sort of what we continue to be doing uh, right now. So I just want to give a little bit of background on UMass. Um, whew, that was interesting. Again, eye chart. <laughs> um, like many of you um, who have put in new electronic health records, you know it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> uh, the role that we play in informatics uh, really has been focused around the system development life cycle, right? The whole idea of the building, the testing, the training, the testing, the training, the <laughs> testing, the training, uh, all that that goes on. We started way back in 2015. Uh, we realized that our current system, the Siemens Sorian uh, system, was uh, not going to meet our needs. Um, and the organization made the very courageous decision, like many of yours, to go to a new electronic health record at a price tag of about $700 million. Um, so that was huge, a big leap, 
and for leaders a huge, uh, courageous move, right? So then fast forward through all that, you all know what that work is, right? That's the work that was defined, uh, the, the playbook was set, so to speak, to get us to our um, go live in um, October, and then this Saturday we're taking a double upgrade, again, like many of you have done, uh, to the system to get caught up with um, Epic. Because what happens with Epic, um, as the EHR vendor here, is you start in 2015, it takes you 18 months to two years to finish. By the time you're done, your software is already out of date. <laughs> so you have to do a, a double upgrade to get sort of back on track. Um, so this is a great uh, chart. Every organization I've ever been in has one similar to it that shows their investment and how they've marched it out, right? But you can see it's starting to fall off. Now what? <laughs> it's starting to think, what's next? What, what do you do after, after all this? So... Um, Many of you uh, know about the Valley of Despair. So this is a cycle that um, Gartner puts out and others as well that says sort of, you know, in terms of the um, proficiency of the functions with the system and then the quality um, as a function of the system, um, how, does, how does it go? And it typically has this sort of honeymoon period that happens right after you turn the system on, and then you quickly fall into what we call the Valley of Despair. It's got other names, right? We all know what that is. That's where it's, life is settling in, the system's horrible, it's never going to work for me. Um, I got I to gotta figure out how to... You know, I got to figure out my workarounds, right? Which introduce all kinds of uh, interesting uh, challenges. So we're still very deep in the valley of the spirit. You may ask. Physicians are probably down by that green star. Nursing is coming out of the uh, valley of despair a little bit, but everybody goes through it. It's a common, it's a common cycle, right? Of um, part of what what we we do. Uh, but that's that's where we are um, right now as an entity. I just wanted to sort of level set so that we can see. Um, just a matter of perspective. What are the um, interesting, so I joined late. Um, as many of you know, I was at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center and did a similar implementation there and then joined UMass about um, nine months before they were going to go live. So too late to influence the um, bills. That train had already left the station, but early enough to do some cool things. So the, um, the folks who have the big E on their shoulder uh, shirts are actually new grads. Well, so my role um, when I joined UMass was both uh, informatics and education. So I inherited the entire sort of education function, nursing education function at UMass, which is huge. We have a graduate school of nursing attached to the um, building where we sit in, um, it sits in the same building as the medical school. Um, so lots of um, opportunity there. But we call these our EPIC implementation partners. We, we did a special residency program where we brought these, brought these folks in early, immersed them in EPIC before it actually went live, and sort of extended out what we would normally do for a residency program and have them uh, be sort of almost like super users. They actually turned out to be extremely super, super users. If I had to do it all over again, I would do this, but ten, double it. I would have it more um, residents here, because what happened was fascinating. <laughs> These folks were very much novice in their nursing practice by definition, right, because they're nursing residents. But they became experts in EPIC because we, again, just immersed them in it. They went to all the training. They went to training for different roles. Um, they did testing. They did um, authorization, you know, all types of testing. Um, but they just did a really fantastic job. So what happened was our more experienced nurses at the bedside were expert nurses but novice to EPIC. And by the time we were getting ready to go live, these <laughs> folks who were novice nurses really became experts for, for the EPIC system and really had great relationships which hold today with their, um, with their nurse partners. So I think it was one of the things we did particularly well um, there. We also did our pit crew, our practice integration teams, which the EAPs participated in. The practice integration teams were um, Denise, Goldsmith coined the term buttonology, the training that our vendor suggests that we do is really which buttons do I press and how do I navigate the mouse and click. Um, that's not very helpful when you're trying to figure out how to integrate that into your nursing practice, right? So we had practice integration teams that did five to 10, sometimes 15 minute um, scenario based cases um, at the point of care. So they would take a while up to the fourth floor prior to go live and they would say, okay, we're gonna hang blood in EPIC and just show them using everything, all real equipment, tactical training, all that stuff, and run a simulation. We're going to discharge a patient. Here's what you do. So we would run those um, sort of at the point of care um, um, scenarios as, as well. Oops, wrong way. All right, so let's, um, this again is preaching to the choir. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but 
I want to reground us in this because sometimes we get lost in this ourselves. And I find it interesting. Um, I sort of inherited an informatics team, and at UMass we're sort of um, set up a little bit different than some organizations. We actually have a CNIO at the system level who reports up to IT, and I'm a CNIO at the operational level reporting up to the chief nursing officer, so we have both. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting is sometimes um, I find that we emphasize different syllables, right? So the IT structure is all about the data, right? And when you get right down to it, let's face it, all these the $700 million electronic health record for us is nothing more than a glorified spreadsheet when you get right to it, right? It's pretty. It's got, you know, nice icons and whatnot. But at the end of the day, it's a data entry tool, right? Um, and the focus from an IT perspective is really, I think, on that data, the build, the testing, and getting, getting it out versus the integration with practice, which happens um, later. So I wanted to sort of reground us in this because as we think about the future, I would argue what's happening is we're moving up this continuum, right? As we leave the meaningful use area era and start leaving implementation, the what next I think has less to do with data because we sort of got that covered and more to do with knowledge and generation of um, wisdom out of the um, out of the our informatics. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here other than just repeating what I just said, the emphasis on a certain syllable, right? So this is our system development. This is a system development lifecycle. It should look familiar. You've seen multiple versions of this, but they're all basically the same thing. And you think about early on, um, the emphasis is on the IT syllable, but as you get closer to the end of the cycle, the emphasis shifts, really. We have that sort of moment when the system is handed over to operations, right, and say, here you go, have at it, put it live, right? Um, that happens somewhere in the testing training go live era in part, right? Um, and I think that's a, another important distinction for us to keep in mind in terms of our informatics is we span this whole thing. Sometimes people look at us from the outside and they see us on one side or the other of this um, continuum. And the truth is we really span the, um, we span the entire um, cycle. So what's what's going on post each And this is the conversation part. So um, I put some down here in terms of our experience at uh, UMass in terms of the post EHR challenges that we have on the left hand side. Unintended consequences, you know, that's a given, right? We have those workarounds that every nurse on the planet can work around anything if you let them, right? So we have to really watch for what what are those unintended work workarounds. My all time favorite was. Uh, um, we had a medication safety issue and had to do a little bit of a deep dive, and we found out that nurses on one unit were um, printing uh, bracelets out of the uh, back of the nurse's station and having them in their pockets so that when they went to scan, they could just scan the bracelet, not scan the actual bracelet. So, um, or, or the ADT labels, and they put them on the um, in, in the NICU yeah. on the bassinet. Yes. Oh, that's another good one. Yes. Yep. Many, many, many examples. Right. Uh, workarounds, same thing. You know, what, what can I do to make this quicker? Um, I hate, we have, in EPIC, we have required documentation. Yeah. Uh, the nurses gravitate to that because they're so checklist mentality, right? That they, they complete required documentation, but they leave off everything else, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of a workaround. It's like they get through the work, uh, but they're not really completing the nursing um, assessments or surveys. Um, communication challenges are huge. This this one spans the gamut. It's not just a nursing problem. The communication challenges include everything from, you know, docs no longer feeling like they need to talk to nurses and nurses no longer feeling like they need to talk to docs and everybody thinking that everything's in the computer, so why do I need to talk the to anyone? The digital divide. The digital divide, yes, exactly. Yep, yep. When we were looking at our, our hardware requirements, yeah. you know, it was like, just put everything everywhere. I'm like, I'm telling you. You're going to see less physicians in this place because they won't need to be here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They only need to. They used to have to go to the nurses right. to get the information. Yeah. They no longer needed to do that. Exactly. So they were in offices somewhere or across, especially on a large mm -hmm. campus. Yeah. Right. Yep. They are sending stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Well, they one of my famous comments is they're ordering from the desk. They haven't seen the patient. Yes. Yeah. And they're oh, yeah. ordering. <laughs> sure. They're ordering for this patient who. You know, to have an IV. Well, she's an IV. She has to be, if you'd shown up at the bedside, she had horrible burns. Yeah. She wasn't getting an IV. We're going to have to look. Mm -hmm. But it's that whole yeah. understanding yeah. that gets lost. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we see the communication challenges all yeah. all over. 
Um, workflow changes, of course, that, that's a, a big one. Who's doing what now? You know, what, so at our facility, we did not, believe it or not, in this day and age, have a CPOE in the inpatient setting prior to October 1st of 2017. That's the truth. So unit secretaries were still transcribing orders. What do they do now? Um, in, in our facility, almost everybody is in some type of union uh, or another, a, a labor management function. Um, so we had to figure out what, what's the workflow, what's the work, and redesign um, work. That never happened as part of the implementation. It sort of got figured out um, later. My all-time favorite is the click overhead. This is a big one. Did I say Oh, I had overheard. Thank you for letting me correct that. Uh, overhead. This is a big one for the docs, but also for nursing. The emphasis, if you were to walk uh, to UMass right now and ask a physician, they would tell you this is their number one problem. A lot of clicks in our EHR are shifted from um, medical assistants, support staff, and registered nurses in an ambulatory setting to the physician. So, for example, a lot of rooming activities, taking your blood pressure and getting your history and all that, a lot of that work shifted and causes additional clicks for uh, physicians in the ambulatory setting. And it's just a function of the vendor's sort of foundation system and how they set it up. The same is true, though, for nursing. If you look at, uh, it makes me crazy every time I see it, an admission assessment, the PCS, yeah. right? It just goes on and on and on and on and on and on with a lot of data that nobody ever looks at, ever, right? It just, it's, we capture it because we've captured it since the dinosaurs roamed, and we just continue to, to do that. And nobody's really using that, that data. And when you're going live, even though we have four years, three years to go live, you pretty much mimic your current state, right? That's what you do. Um, but this click overhead, I think, is the biggest opportunity, and we'll talk about value in a minute. I think it's one of the biggest areas where we can provide um, some opportunity to get nurses back to the bedside and um, introduce uh, them to a sort of better experience with the system. Reporting and analytics, um, I'm sure many of you are dealing with that. Um, you know, trying to get data out of, from the spreadsheet data entry tool is really tough. Again, I, I really do believe that all of our vendors, not just the one that we happen to have, but all of the vendors are really thinking about their systems um, in terms of a very sophisticated spreadsheet for data input, and they're not really thinking about output as much. And that's where the challenge comes in, the whole how do you tell the patient's story, right? How do you pull that data out and recreate the story of the patient right here and right now? Some places try to do that, um, but uh, others are not as um, successful, and I think it's a real op opportunity. We're still to this day, so a year out plus, unable to have our basic quality indicators reliably out of the um, system. We're still running um, and relying on old ways of getting quality indicators mm -hmm. out for many of our many of our quality indicators, I, not I, all. Yeah, I, I'll chime in though from, because that's pretty much the work that I do now at yeah. you know, Mac and you know, all that. Yeah. A lot of it is there's just not enough structured data. Right. And it's even within one system, and we just can't get at it. Yeah. So if you can't code it and map it, you can't yep. report on it. Exactly. And there's nothing standardized, in between departments. They've got three nursing assessments, and no one really knows where they all are yeah. to tell me where the blood pressures are. So I'm going to miss two of them, right? right? Yeah. Or one of them's update. It's amazing. It is. You know? It's like trying to put the pieces of the puzzle all together. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the, you're right. The, the systems were not necessarily implemented with standards in mind or structure in mind. Is Epic supporting, I mean, are they any help in that area? You know, when you, you hear about, you know, now you don't need structured data. You can do scraping. You can do, there are no, algorithms. No, 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 and, and you that's know what? It sounds good, and that's what people will ask you for. Right. But honestly, and I think the other piece of it is too, is getting your organization to start using data effectively right. and getting nurse directors and staff to understand you know, for the data, and you're putting this in, and now you've got two pressure ulcers because you put them both in, yeah. and it really is only one. Yeah. So we, uh, at Partners, we redid the entire dashboard with, yeah. uh, with like, some resources from Epic, and um, we've used those for our hack issues, yeah. and we're driving nurses at the bedside to use that data so that they don't have to, at the beginning, yeah. they call it hack day, of, to get the information from the whole unit, you can just go in and do a quick yeah. audit yeah. of everything. So we're driving. We're trying to do that. So it's hard yeah. to get yeah. people there. The Mark item issue, though, is that mm -hmm. the out-of-the-box version of the quality oh, data. No, yeah. no, no. 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 It's horrible. It's, yeah. it's, so absolutely. it's taken us three years to get a, now a yeah. dashboard that people like. It's usable. It makes sense when you look at it. Uh, but it's been a lot of, lot of work to yeah. get there. 
And one of the things they don't tell you during the sales cycle when they're showing you all the pretty screens and the input and the great reports, that if you're a system, so we have five hospitals, right, Like, but, um, you know, spread out over different areas, and the beauty of the system is that it's one database, one record. It's also the curse because when you ask for a report, the starting place is everybody's data, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's pulling from all five entities. And you can then start to slice and dice, but guess what? Those aren't really competencies that our managers yeah. really yeah. have yeah. strength in. Yeah. And that's, again, I think another opportunity for nursing informatics is, you know, we're asking our frontline managers to look at the hack stuff and to do that, but to actually slice and dice through data is just not a skill that they really yeah. uh, possess. And do they have, is it um, a... Um is it an epic tool, or do they use yeah. things like Tableau and things like well, that? We we have a whole Little separate thing. group that yeah. that um, does Tableau just at the Brigham and not at right. the department mm -hmm. level. Yeah. But we, like I know my group, we tend to I tend to rely on reporting workbench workbench reports, which are limiting. Yeah. But at least you can get some data out. Like you can, just time. you know, you can. I mean, if with some a little bit of skill, you can kind of put together and then. It's you know it, it's just at that moment and it downloads to a spreadsheet and then kind of like but it's I I often go back to um, what value does nursing informatics have in yeah. reporting and because I know the the clinical issue sometimes I'll be putting a report together and go yeah it'd be really nice to have this too yeah and it's sometimes when you're when you're in a work group, you don't know what to ask. Right. You don't know what's in the system, yeah. but I know it's in there somewhere. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. like for the happy group, the uh, uh, pressure injury, you know, we 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 did this kind of like report um, of the whole organization, and it was like, you know, it'd be nice to see if they had a procedure because a lot of those patients, I'm like, oh, that's in there somewhere. Yeah. So you you know, you just yeah. kind of um, develop those skills right. and. It's, I'm not giving you what you want, I'm giving you what you need. Yeah, exactly. Because you, you, you know the clinical uh, build and you know what information. If you fill out a, a request to say this is what I want, yeah. the guy on the other end doesn't know that you, you, you should really have the service they're on. You yeah. should have, you know, if they had a, you need more, you can, you can make it a larger report. And I always get pushed back on these calls, and they're like, oh, no, that'll make a report too large. I'm like, make it as big as you want. Yeah. Just cut those columns off. Because yeah. <laughs> no one's looking at them anyway. Right? It's, it's yeah. fascinating yeah. when you, like, my background was in the government, so we were all, it's all about the data. So I was like, give me everything, yeah. and I'll narrow it down. Yeah. I, we mm -hmm. have the tools to do mm -hmm. that. But you, you'd hear some people on the call, oh, no, we don't need that. Oh, no. You don't think you need it, but you're, you're going to need it in next year. You don't know what to ask for, yeah. And, and then to go back and re-request that, yeah. it just becomes more. Absolutely, after the fact. Because it, it, it's kind of, it, it becomes its own bureaucracy to even get a report. Oh, you can't fill it yourself. we're waiting in a queue. You know, that's, that's why the nursing's waiting, so we're waiting in a queue. The, the other thing that we noticed is that because the way Epic is developed with multiple applications, there's multiple ways to put information in, and they all don't map Exactly no, the same. No, no. So needing to have that bridge person to understand where you should be going to get the data well, is important. Yeah, that and, you know, Newsflash, Epic doesn't have it all, right? So for mm -hmm. us, we're still, our falls data, for example, is in our, our safety risk intelligence mm -hmm. report, right? Yeah. So I can get some information out of Epic. There's, there's a lot in there, but it doesn't have every, age yeah. caps. You know, my patient satisfaction data is not in yeah. Epic. So yeah. we need to be able to be able to pull all that together and put those design specs together. <laughs> So the right-hand side is really sort of what's next, in my mind, the post-EHR challenge, and I think we're all sort of uh, singing from the same hymn book, the optimization, whatever that is. I, I haven't <laughs> seen it yet, so I will let you know once I do. I know what it should look like, um, but hopefully we'll get there. Um, I do think reviewing nursing data sets, this is where, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've had speakers come to NENEC, right, who've talked about their, um, uh, the um, Health Corp of Mary Jane uh, talked about right. Yeah. about how they went through and just ripped out data that nobody's mm -hmm. using anymore yeah. and stuff. The beauty of being live a year is that we actually have metadata on our data, right? So I can actually see who's touching what, who's doing what, who's actually filling in versus, you know, I, I look online at some of these assessments and people don't even answer half the stuff, right, mm -hmm. because it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Mark, I yeah. think he's asking you some tiny stuff there. Oh. Because they're on mute. Thank you, oh, Mark. Oh, 
Oh, Snowman CT is a great state to determine how it's already. Yes, absolutely, already. Thank you. Um, that is uh, a huge standard um, that hopefully will have maps to um, to this and will help, I think, over time. But I got a slide coming up to Teresa's point about um, sort of the structured data versus non-structured data. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating to see what we think is structured versus not structured. Mm -hmm. So I won't go through uh, any more of these, but you get the idea. The left-hand side is some of the challenges. The right-hand side is sort of what we... Um, think we need to um, to do about it. Can I ask a question? Sure. I was really impressed with Ellen Pollack when she came and when they were talking about optimization because she had kind of a governance model yeah. putting in. And I wonder if you're doing anything like that. And I really like their like 40 hours or less yeah. than the kind of nursing manages, but 40 hours or more goes into IT. And to the yeah, we do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And um, the one thing I will say is we had a pretty good governance structure. We call them partnership councils, integrated work groups. I'm sure everyone has the same type of thing. And it's, you have to have some type of governance structure in order to prioritize. Fortunately, um, the CNO who I reported to made sure that I had a seat on the highest level of that governance because uh, you would not believe the number of decisions that come to that group that people think are non-nursing related that mm -hmm. actually are uh, nursing impacts. And if you don't have a seat at that table, then you can't influence that prioritization and resourcing and all that. So uh, for me, that's been a big, um, a big help. Um, this is the communication <laughs> slide, uh, you know, and we see this every day, unfortunately, um, communication challenges all over the place, um, and it's one that we really need to fix. I don't know about where you work, but at UMass right now, if you were to walk up into one of our nursing, inpatient nursing units, they are using um, Kyocera flip phones, literally flip phones is what they have for their communication device uh, for nursing. So when we think about communication, there's so many different levels of it, right? There's the physician to nurse communication, there's communi written and verbal communication that happens through the system, um, but we really need to be thinking about communication broadly, and that's one of my focus areas. Um, we're moving away from those um, devices, but then what? What, do, what does that mean and what does that look like? And again, what's the role of nursing informatics when you talk about uh, mobile devices or communication strategies. <laughs> yeah. This is um, data, right? So we're live. Yep. <laughs> Drinking from the data fire hose of all the data out there. And it really does feel like that some days. Um, we, I spend a lot of time. So the way our system's set up, like Deb mentioned, there's different reporting systems within Epic. There's the reporting workbench. Uh, which is the here and now data, patients in the bed kind of data that we are, use pretty regularly. And then they have a more sophisticated um, reporting thing called Clarity that crosses, sort of um, goes a little bit deeper um, within it. But that's never enough, right? You need, we need more uh, reporting capabilities. And I, I really do feel it, it does feel like drinking from this uh, information fire hose. And at the same time, what I'm struggling with um, in my role is that I have a layer of management that really does not have core or even basic informatics competencies mm -hmm. in terms of skill sets and manipulating data and looking at data, let alone information or knowledge and how that all um, fits in. Um, I've showed this before. I'm not going to go through this here. You guys saw this um, if you came to uh, when I was here last, actually. This is the, um, the uh, diagram of the causes of mortality uh, from Florence Nightingale uh, in the Crimean War. And the, the reason I love this so much is that this really shows a way to um, use graphic representation of data, right? So the dark blue represents um, those patients that during the war actually died from war-related injuries. They were shot, they were whatever, or whatever they did back then. Mm -hmm. uh, the blue and the red represent things other than that. And uh, it was really mostly, um, if you look at the data, and you can see, the way this is kind of backwards, this shows from uh, the, the right-hand side is the early part, and then over here you can see some of the blue goes away. That's because um, during this period, Florence Nightingale recognized that it wasn't the battle wounds that was killing everybody, it was cholera, typhus, and dysentery, right? So we worked to reduce that, and the graphic shows how, and this was actually the start of the first Army hospital. I'm an Army guy. <laughs> so um, really cool stuff. Um, and I think it's really important that data analytics, it's not new to us at all, right? It goes way, way back here. But the thing that I take about it and I apply to my practice is this concept of data visualization, taking a whole bunch of data. Imagine how much data is behind mm -hmm. this, years and years of wartime data, right? But it's collapsed down to two graphics that still resonate today, right? So we have to be able to do that for multiple um, reasons. Um, 
this too is a great slide if you're ever trying to figure out reporting uh, maturity. I think I stole this from Gartner. Oh, yeah, it's Gartner um, down the bottom right-hand side. And the reason I like it is because it shows the progression and the maturity of reporting, right? From hindsight, what happened, all the way up to foresight, how can we make it happen or predicting that it's going to happen? Many of us are in this descriptive analytics phase. I know that's where I'm living these days, the bottom left-hand side of this graph. I'm just trying to figure out what the hell happens. Did we get the flu vaccinated? Did we get the patient vaccinated or not? Right? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, the why did it happen and what will happen, that comes later, I think, as we sort of mature over time. But this is what you hear a lot of folks in business intelligence talking about sort of moving up and all the way up to predictive analytics where we're actually able to anticipate some things like perhaps sepsis or some of the um, other um, sort of things that we're looking to get ahead of. How do people find that being received? That I think those of us that see the data, you know, really work with it, um, and understand it because we're clinicians, trying to explain that we can actually use some of this information and we can help and we can be predictive. Yeah. I, I brought it up numerous times at high-level meetings with, you know, nurse leaders, and they're like, well, we're different, or we don't need that, or, yeah. you know, like, yeah. well, we're not ready, you know, not understanding mm -hmm. that if if you look at the number of, you know, we're having a lot of nurses calling out. Yeah. You probably could go back and look and plot that information over the past five, six years and know exactly, I mean, you know it. You know when there's a full moon, you're going to have more babies. <laughs> yeah. You know when, you know, there's a, uh, you know, St. Patrick's Day in Boston. A rally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Right. My I mean, weekend, last weekend. Right. Exactly that. Exactly. I closed this. Yeah. Oh, close yeah. Yeah. So, so looking at the data, but people yeah. are you you know it. It's intuitive. It's it's just like you're gonna you know the stairs too big. You're probably gonna have to reach yeah. higher. Yeah. People, but hearing that and actually investing in in that process is hard. I find it yeah. like, is it just within nursing or outside of nursing? Um, I think it's outside. It's definitely outside yeah. of nursing too. They're, they're not. Nobody wants to do the little tiny bit of work. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So maybe a good exemplar for that to help people start to shift their thinking is looking at risk of rehospitalization because that's something that has a financial impact. So whoever in the room is worried about that, understand that it has a um, you know some core competency issues, and it's something that is is really low hanging fruit as far as predictability is concerned. So I try to choose when I find I have a mixed audience that um, is easily or or a single audience that's easily positioned like, I don't want to know, or I can't know it's too much, going for something that is easy to understand, that hits both the, the financial uh, relationship to the patient as well as the quality of caring for the patient seems to resonate well. Were you at Trends last year? Yes. Oh, you were? All right. Well, it, I, the only reason I ask is I put Dan uh, Roberts' presentation up. It's just audio because he said he couldn't see Yeah, he was amazing. Yeah. And it might be yeah. fun to share that with some of yeah. it. Have like a, a yeah. discussion group, have a brown lunch. I know. And ask him to reflect on what yeah. he said because he gets to some of those things. And I really empathize with you on how difficult it can be to, to shift people into that world to look at, you know, because to me it's a no-brainer. You're analytically, whether you're looking at sepsis, whether you're looking at malnutrition, staffing, et cetera. So, you know, maybe you need something to talk about why is it. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. You have something to show them. And, and, I, and I, think show them. I think that I always bring data to the table. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a discussion, whether they ask for it or not. Yeah. So yeah. The, the agenda is we're going to look at, you know, let's look at a process measure for, you know, hospital quiet yeah. or pressure injuries. And they, um, at our organization, they didn't initially have somebody from nursing informatics on those groups. And then quickly learned that first they needed best practice documents to choose their process measure, and when they chose the process measure, they, you should always choose something that's readily available right. to get a report, right. because otherwise you're not you get, to nobody, it's manual. going to take you two years to add a new column. Yeah. So you might, let's use something that's not really what's going to give you the 100% data, but it'll give you 80% yeah. 80 of it. But now I think, um, you know, when I'm, you know, on those discussions, I'm like, well, we, what, where's the data? How are we tracking this? Yeah. How are we going to know if you're effective if you're not having the data? Yeah. These people are doing eight-hour chat audits. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, it, it, yeah. it, it's it's well, very interesting to present this information to others who don't trust the data. Mm -hmm. And I heard a quote once, the people that are only doing, um, are only getting 20% um, improvements 
um, are the ones that always question the data. The people yeah. that are at 80 percent are like, we believe the data because we used it to get yeah. where we are. Which isn't it fascinating that we're talking about a healthcare institution, right? Don't we live and die by the oh. evidence and the data? And the, right, like literally live and die by the. Right. But yet we we deny it. We're we're quick to shoot it down. My my answer really is um, you have to show them, right? So we're we're in the process right now of doing our sepsis um, sort of integration, and we're pre trying to predict <coughs> sepsis using a lot of the standard industry LACE scores and all that. And we're actually now able to show that our sepsis predictor is actually a predictor of sepsis. Um, so, and you can show them how that ha how that happens. But until you do that, you, mm -hmm. it's like bringing bring the horse to the water, right? You're not and you know what? I find it absolutely criminal that some of these large organizations, one of which I work for, never wants to go and use someone else's tool. Right. Let's make it from Good. the ground up. Yeah. So I'm like, really? Someone hasn't done this? <laughs> why, why do we think we're so smart yeah. that we can't use someone else's? It's so true. It's, 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 it's crazy. Imagine it's how much so money true. we could pull out of the system if oh. we did just have a standard way of looking at substance, for example, or and, any of these. And, 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 and I'm sure there, there's evidence in a lot of journal articles about how to do this, yeah. but oh no, let's all build it all over again. Yeah. Again, that's, that's that inability to kind of look past what's right in your face. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's it's an all it's all a cultural change too, yeah. and those <clears throat> those are not simple to mm -hmm. change. So it takes a long time, you know, three to five years to really make mm -hmm. a culture cultural difference mm -hmm. in an organization, especially one that is very large. And then you get complexity when you have multiple uh, facilities included in your enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a it's a big mindset change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just like Deb said, I, I, I agree with her, just getting the director level folks to really um, take responsibility for the mm -hmm. information that's readily at hand and do something yeah. with it yeah. um, has taken quite a bit of work. Yeah. So, See, I don't have time for it until I get called out for right. something. Yeah. 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 Where's, that, where's that report right. that I need now yeah. because now I have to monitor this. Exactly. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Exactly yeah. what so, happened. A lot of times exactly. I will predict what they're going to look for <laughs> yeah. and then say, well, isn't that funny? I sent you that last week <laughs> and you said you didn't have time to look at it. <laughs> this <laughs> predictive analytics. I'll be happy for to one. fix that for you. <laughs> yeah. That's your yeah. zen. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. It's, yeah, it's, it it's is. Because then you prove the value of your role Correct. because yeah. you're already like, well, no, I added that. You didn't even ask for it, but I knew from being at the meeting, you were going to need it, yeah. so I added it. That'd yeah. be a, that's a lot of yeah. problems. Yeah. Yeah. Job, yeah, job security, yeah. not that you need That it. might be, has to be a topic for a future meeting, because, that, I mean, that is, even as we've looked at informatics competencies, people are receptive all the way up to the C-suite and then stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really an issue, and I'm not sure how to crack it. So maybe we can talk about it in our group and really look at it. Yeah, for us, so one of the uh, roles I have at UMass is as part of the uh, nursing executive leadership team, you pick up call, right, and you're on call for a week. And you're actually, because we have, we also have an administrator on call, but because nearly every issue is nursing, it's, you know, you're, you're pretty much on 24-7 for seven days. And any time you're on call at UMass, you're guaranteed to have a flow issue. So the flow issue is on any given day, we have 30-plus inpatient boarders in our emergency room. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the university campus alone. That's that's a 53-bed emergency department with 30-plus boarders. You can imagine. Of the 30, most often there's five to seven that are ICU level of care. Um, so we're, we're looking at data, right? So what, what happened? Why, and why does this keep happening, right, with that data? Why did it happen? What was going on? And sometimes you know the answer, but you just need the data to prove it, right? Mm -hmm. The reason it happens at our institution, I can tell you right now, is because it's an academic medical center, and we don't feel like doing rounds until 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock. <laughs> so nobody gets discharged until 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock. So that's why this patient is in the emergency room, right? But in the absence of any data to show that it's not anything else, you really don't have um, a leg to stand on. So it is a good point, and it's one of the things, again, of how do we demonstrate the value of nursing informatics? I think a lot of it is taking the data and converting it to information, right? Yeah. And hopefully getting a little bit of new knowledge. Um, 
I did this slide a couple of years ago because, um, you know, again, we've all been focused on EHR, 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 right? But we think about the person. That's the first thing they teach at a nursing school, right? It's, on a, it's the patient, the person as a whole. And if you were to look at um, the sort of our EHR data, you know, and assume a patient had a one uh, hospital stay with an average length of stay, I think I assumed what, a couple of, a couple of 4.8 days here. Yeah, UMass is actually 5.5 days. But that data that we gather on that patient during that one, that, that one visit is really a small slice of that total person, right? It doesn't include the genome. It doesn't include their, their um, sort of non-health-generated uh, data, so the patient-generated data. It doesn't have their uh, Fitbit information in it even, right? So you have to think about that. When you, we're making clinical decisions based on a very small slice of data that we happen to have on this patient at this this time. So um, I think it's an important thing for us to keep in mind, too, as we think about what's next for Nursing Informatics 2.0 is life beyond the EHR and data beyond the EHR. Um, this gets to what uh, Teresa was saying. So um, this is so health determinants, right, re representing 10% of the person and how much data that involves. This is actually from IBM Watson team. 30% um, of the data of the person is really uh, found in the genomic factors. You can really gather a lot of data there. But you get, you get the idea that um, health determinants, you know, sort of those things that we don't even know about yet that really influence health. Um, that we, we need to get our arms around in order to be able to make better decisions and to have a, a more robust uh, data set. Um, so to answer your question, 80% uh, of clinical data is unstructured, right? That's the history and physical that they might pull in some canned text, yeah. but really it's really unstructured data when you get right down to it. Um, so that makes it really hard from a reporting and uh, analytics perspective, even in this uh, day and age. Anybody read this? Great book. Uh, if you haven't read it, put it on the list of... Uh, light reading oh, called Habit. Um, it can help you with anything from losing weight to uh, whatever. <laughs> but what it's really all about yeah. is um, the habits that you would form and you know, how it sticks after a certain amount of time. And what's interesting is, so we look at that small slice of data, retail looks at habits, right? They look at your buying habits and they can see that very clearly on your MasterCard Visa, right? They, can, they have all kinds of data that they can uh, see. There's an interesting um, story in, the, in this book about a um, father of a teenage girl in Texas who got mad at the local Target for sending his daughter prenatal vitamin coupons. <laughs> Um, as it turns out, the analytics engine at Target noticed that she bought a tote bag that was a little bit bigger than your average one, maybe big enough for diapers, and had some other buying habits that they had uh, found. And their analytic tune um, engine was fine-tuned to that, and they were spot on, unfortunately. Dad, Dad left eating crow. So, um, yeah. So the idea that there's more data out there, right, this data is being used outside of our industry um, in terms of the, the psychodemographic psycho data, you know, what makes people tick. You know, is Mary Jones, who I just prescribed Lasix to, likely to fill that prescription or is her income at a level and her pattern or habit at a level where she never fills prescription because she can't afford it? Right? It would be great to know that before she left the hospital and becomes a readmission, right? So it's that type of thinking, so the next wave, what are we, uh, what are we going to be well, looking that's at? That's what the Walmart and the CVS Absolutely. integration is all about, because yep. they're not only going to um, document that the patient filled or didn't fill their Lasix, yep. but that they bought, you know, five packages of potato chips and, you know, um, yep. and, you know cans of uh, tomato soup with the, you know, salted, mm -hmm. and they're going to make those correlations and bring that, you know, to the forefront. Well, how on Amazon with Alexa yeah. listening to all oh, conversations yeah. happening yeah. in the house? And, oh, yeah. You know, you know. <laughs> and, and the one that, the one that, you know, the newest one that she left off is Aetna and CVS. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. So that's, that's the, that's the fundamental. That's, that's, that's where it's headed. And this is the stuff that the HIMSS board's looking at, too, very closely to see what, what what's happening with this. And they look to see where investments are being made. It's very clear um, that they're, um, if we don't get it right, someone's going to get it right for mm -hmm. us, right? Mm -hmm. Target doesn't have HIPAA. Mm -hmm. No, 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 they're not a company. They're not a company. It doesn't apply. No, nope. yeah. yeah. no, those rules don't apply. No, nope. great. <laughs>
So just to be a little uh, profound, come back to this sort of ground us in this, thinking about what is next in terms of uh, where we go. And when I, when I present this to my non-nursing informatics friends, I, um, I always describe this scope of practice in the same way. And, you know, you guys all know what data information knowledge. I, I always say knowledge is what's in the textbooks, right? It's what's sort of ingrained there. People always ask me about wisdom. I go, that's easy. That's fey. I'm like, Faye? What do you mean, Faye? When I was a new grad in the ER, <laughs> Faye was my preceptor, Faye Kaplan, no emergency room, and Faye was that nurse, right? Faye was that nurse that could look at an EKG and see normal sinus rhythm and no ST elevation. She could look at the lab values, back then it was CPK, isoenzymes, and MV bands, that were perfectly normal, could look at the patient and say, get the crash cut, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. That was Faye, yeah. because she yeah. had so many years of experience and so much wisdom, mm -hmm. there was something else that she was yeah. processing, she couldn't even tell you what it was, yeah. right? That to me is what wisdom is, mm -hmm. and we actually can be able to pull that out of the, um, of the systems too, because wisdom is in there, we just need to find yeah. it. Right. Um, but that's Wandy how- Wandy has a really good book that describes that. Oh, really? I forget which one it is, but he described why a uh, there was a fire, and a captain went in, and he said, get out. And he got five guys out oh, of the building. Oh, that was not a tool. That was um, not a tool. Um, um, Dr. Oh, Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. Malcolm Gladwell. Oh, no. And I listened, and I oh, listened yes, to yes, that yes, story, yes. and yes. I went, that is exactly nurses yes. who didn't understand the, why they were doing something, but again, it's cost better. Better. crash cut. So, well, yeah, it's called the um, yeah. escape fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fire. yeah. 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 John Burr yeah. mentions that if you haven't it's read really Escape good. Fire, go let me get home and read Escape Fire. It's my change management story because exactly, they they um, they talk about not letting go of the old Pulaski's. Mm. A lot of the firefighters went in with these big axes, mm. and this one guy, Dodd, I think his name was like, no, nah, no, we shouldn't do that, we should change, and mm. they didn't, they all died, he survived. And he created a fire to get out of the fire. This is why it's called escape fire. This, this was the one where they he walked it back and he found out that when when that type of fire is coming, you get heat coming from the back. Yeah. And all of these indicators that he knew from experience yeah. Yeah. that it was going to exactly. it was going to go. Yeah. And he just pulled everybody out, and I was like. Yeah. I remember being a, a young nurse and saying, there's something wrong with the patient. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is, but I've seen it before. Yeah. They say it's the limbic brain. that you're, you, yeah. ha you can't articulate yeah. why you're but feeling you know, the way you're feeling, yeah, you but there's actually data in there that's sending it, but you don't know what yeah. it is yeah. and you, until it happens. Yeah. And you, you try to, in the nurse, novice nurse class, you, you really try to explain to them that you can't just put that there. Yeah. You've got yeah. to be patient and give your brain the time to kind of accept those things and learn and be patient. And, yeah. and I would suggest that it's a form of triage that, that we learn um, in our apprenticeship, um, as you suggested, Mark, yep. early on in our career. Yep. But I really worry or I, I'm concerned about how the next generation of nurses that are learning, um, not with an expert next to them, but with other expert devices that perhaps emulate that. But yep. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this notion of triage. How do you get that sense? into an actual map. Yeah. Well, I think it's going to be different. I mean, I know exactly what she's in the romantic side of me says, oh, yes, I worry about that too. But on the flip side, it's a new generation. I mean, they have a different world. But I think they're still going to have those, the, you know, that it's that I have a feeling. Like, you can't articulate it. But they have a data-rich environment. I mean, mm -hmm. the outcomes are better for patients. People are living longer. I mean, and all this one. No, I don't mean, I, I agree with you. I don't mean to be negative to say it can't happen. It's just, I, it's going to probably be educated and received to a different pathway than the long historical pathways that we learned about. And mm -hmm. so how, it, how much of that transference, what does that transference look like? And I, I think the word that is that I tend to try to use to describe the stuff is, is triage, which, yeah. which is a very complex. I, I worry about critical thinking. So yes. if I, I yes. worry that yes. the over um, use of technology can mm -hmm. lead to a decrease in critical thinking. I have no basis for that, no scientific basis for that. But I just think about the perception. You know, you, you see a nurse scanning and scanning, right? So that nurse isn't using the nurse's brain, they're using the scanner. That's the patient's perception, perhaps. Of that, right? But really, the nurse should be applying critical thinking there, right? And and double checking that I've got the right patient. They have the right. They actually have the right band on because that happens yeah. too, right? Um, it's pretty the method they're given. But sometimes, especially as nurses, we don't think out loud, so people don't think that we're thinking, 
right? Yeah. Yeah, and the technology just supports this idea that perhaps they're not thinking, perhaps they're just... Sometimes they're not thinking. We have reason, I yeah. just, I've been working on this. Again, it's a, it, having a person that w did reports, and then that person left, and the reports... So the pharmacy were doing the MAC reports. The pharmacy said, oh, we have 1% override. Hmm. So I'm in a fairly, fairly new role, and I said, that's great. Um, and then you know, these questions <laughs> popping up, because there's always things like, well, we have nurses that are saying they're doing X, Y, Z, but, you know, um, they, they can't be. There's got to be something wrong with the, with the scanner. So looking at those, pulling those reports, finally getting access, getting the reports, it's you, the amount of overrides for meds, and, yep. and, and actually this one individual nurse is a fairly new nurse, was overriding her patient every time. Yep. <laughs> no joke. Overriding the patient oh, yeah, every time. So something happened. Yeah. She, but she had probably a wonderful preceptor. So just what you're saying, the critical thinking. What happened? She normalized overriding the patient ID band every single time she was on yeah. for like a month until because we just started looking at reports and you know the white flag went up. Oh my God! You know we go up and she, I don't something didn't click that this. She got used to the click. And being able to complete the right. process, Without but not critically thinking about yeah. what that process meant yes. yep. on the other yeah. side. And mm -hmm. that, yeah. that's, that's what we need. That's what nursing informaticists do. Yeah. They create the meaning yeah. in everything they're doing. They, they give context. Yeah. Now, sometimes the nurse doesn't even know. So we had a DPH audit. We hit bad with a, um, with a, a bad medication error and had to do um, actual audits of med, med passes. We in the same boat. Oh, our reports are 99 point whatever. That's great. No, that's not great because that, that's bad. thousands and thousands yeah. of uh, overrides yeah. or something. Yeah. So we went up and did rounds. I went up with my team and we did rounds. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. We went and asked the pediatric nurse. Uh, manager who your best nurse was for barcode meditation. We went around with uh, Nancy who carried a clipboard. She was about 70 something years old. Still had a hey, clipboard. Great down. nurse. No, 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 um, and we were talking about efficiencies and all that. She goes, oh, yeah, I am super efficient. She had all four of her patients' barcode <laughs> labels on, attached to her clipboard. She goes, look, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> and it wasn't until somebody said that, what if you gave the med to the wrong patient? Then she had this epiphany. Like she, This is the way she's done it. So yeah. It's probably on her first. And <laughs> you know, had that epiphany that finally... Oh yeah, I'm bypassing that whole safety net that you put in place right, for seven hundred million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so it's things like that. Again, yeah. I do think that role of nursing informatics professional, even as we still continue to optimize and implement, is key. I also worry about the critical thinking aspect of the fact that we have so much clinical decision support. Yeah. yeah. Now, and not that that's bad. I think it's important, but does it take away some of the things that should trigger in people's brains about? Yeah. why this is important, yeah. and should I anticipate it before it actually yeah. happens? Yeah, so true. Mm. We're dealing with that with flu season this year, for sure, with our um, with our metrics. So, um, again, Flo can't help but re, um, talk about Flo. Just heading into a little bit of quality. You guys have seen this before, too. This is the golden, uh, the, the Back Bay Golden Goose. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's actually right here, based in Boston. You can see it at the uh, Countway Museum. This was a surgeon, uh, Dr. Uh, Ernest uh, Amory Codman, who in uh, 1915, while at Mass General, uh, created a chart where he kept track of whether his patients lived or died. Simple as that. It was He called it the end result system. The end result being that they live or die. Uh, well, as you kind of might be able to imagine, back then he was met with a lot of resistance from the other surgeons at Mass General at the time who really wanted nothing to do with this. They did not want to look at it at all. And that's the ostrich burying the head in, in the sand of this uh, cartoon that he wrote for the, uh, the newspaper back then. This un um, actually ultimately became the, uh, whoops, oh, bad me. What do I do now, Mary? Oh, um, open up. Yeah, just this one? Yep. No, no, no. This, yes. Okay. Um, what ultimately became the uh, Joint Commission. So this end result system oh. really was the foundation <laughs> of what we know today as uh, a... Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's still a little bit buried in the sand. <laughs> um, but I thought it was good to remind it in terms of the quality, because I really do think at the end of the day, um, where nursing informatics 2.0 is headed, is headed down the quality path, right? And that's where we're going to be able to add um, value is what I, I believe. 
this just shows you sort of to pull it back to the finance side of the equation, um, this idea of pay for performance is just increasing, increasing, increasing. This is the Medicare share of payments at risk under, um, un under Medicare. And you can see HACS, we talked about that tonight, the, um, the readmission program and the value-based purchasing program, all something they're really, really emphasizing and raising the bar every year, right, in terms of how we, how we do it. So not just paying us for the services anymore like they used to. Mm -hmm. They're really incentivizing, just like the end result system, us to um, move towards outcomes. So I, I just want to add, just yeah. one thought about that, what makes it really challenging is the specs and regs change every year. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with child abstraction, they change every quarter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whether you're an end user, a mapper, or a vendor, keeping up with those specs. Oh, um, and now we're in a whole new language, SQL, I mean, yeah. SQL, and, yeah. I, you know, I, I, and it's complex to understand. You know, it, it isn't really what some of the quality folks really go through. And when we're noticing, because it's coming so cumbersome and huge, the IP people have implemented systems and they're, they're turning it over to quality. Yeah. And now we've got a lot of quality folks who may or may not have a nice background get the product and don't mm. know what to do. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. And you're starting over. Yeah. Sometimes good because they question the clinical and the data, yeah. right? Oh, well, that doesn't make sense versus I people map and build you anything yeah. you want, yeah. Yeah. and it won't make sense of a chicken in a basket. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And then people like me trying to come in between yeah. and realize you did what? So yeah. That's not what the spec is asking you for, but every year it's yeah. a whole new, and it's, uh, you wonder if some of that's by design, too, right? Because if they change the spec, <laughs> yeah. that leaves the money holding in their accounts a little bit longer, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to wonder about that. It's also putting in the, 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 the data extractors, trying to look for those elements within the record versus building something that has that box checked. It was interesting, and in, in, um, working with medical records, if you put that box check and keep it in the medical record and somebody just has charted it for the fourth time now and they just don't check that box right, then you don't get paid. Yep. They have been mm -hmm. paid, you know, so that rest cycle, that whole thing gets destroyed because somebody wants that box checked for their, you know, their yep. data extraction. And I think that's, yep. that's something I... Well, I, I love the, yeah. the program, so we were dealing with flu season and all that, right? So programmers, they, think they have specs that they go through, right? So they were looking at last filed value, right? Mm -hmm. So what was happening was last filed value was, was the patient screened, yes, right, versus mm -hmm. no because they, they came in with um, needing the flu vaccine. So we were looking like everybody was a yes. Oh, okay. In fact, <laughs> we had actually screened them, done that, given them a shot, but they're looking as if they had already been had it before their admission. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all about, you know, what data are you looking at? Are you going back right. all the way? Or are you looking right. at just the yeah. last well, file we value? Have a well, and it, that's the, again, that's informatic, yeah. mm -hmm. is understanding when you get data and you look at it and you go, that doesn't sound yeah. right. There's something wrong right. with that. Do some validation and say, oh, here it is. This yeah. is why. Yeah. Get them out of the fire. Well, yeah. the, the, yeah. even just the, the sort of semantics of um, that from a practice perspective, this is where practice overlaps with IT, right? So have you had flu vaccine this flu season? Many people don't read the this flu season or recognize that this yeah. flu season was actually September. So they'll look up in the immunization history and see that the patient had a flu vaccine in 2017 and think, oh, we're good. Right, and mm -hmm. say yes to that, whereas somebody else, so it's not just the data, it's how do you interpret the data, how are you, how are you inputting the data, et cetera. But, but it's also how you map the yes and the no's and what it means. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Clients, you know, no, I didn't get it. Oh, great, you say it. Well, no, I'm going to give it to you in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't want it because you, you have an yeah. allergy. Yeah. Yeah. They're not looking at the full, and, and they'll map it, and sometimes. Oh, I got the one this week. Um, they don't need it, they do it wrong. We have a contraindication that Dr. Smith in the joint service line doesn't want his patient vaccinated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, CDC doesn't, doesn't recognize Dr. Smith that way. Let them give them the, the 80,000 people died last year. In yeah. The right. And hospitalized so patients are far people. more susceptible to death after, yeah. from flu if they're hospitalized. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about in terms of sort of the next wave of informatics is this concept of RIPE. In my role, like I said I mentioned I've um, sort of inherited education as part of my informatics role. I'm like, well, does that really work? How does that work? And it actually does work because really what I'm finding is our value proposition now is really dependent upon RIPE. And what I mean by RIPE is research, having the evidence-based research and the research skills at the table. Informatics skills absolutely need to be there for all the reasons you all know we've been discussing. 
the patient in practice, the P is the patient in the practice, right? Having that practice, what's actually happening on the floors, because that can be very different than what our builders who are nurses in the IT department think it might or should be going on. And then the education component. How do we deliver education so that it sticks? It's adult learning theory sensitive and all that. So I'm finding that this model is working for me, at least, um, as we look to transition to our next um, sort of world around this. And it really surrounds uh, the value in the middle of it. So uh, a, good, a good example for me is um, this flu season, we did use the same concept, right? We looked at the literature. What is the CDC saying? It changes. Even the flu vaccine, mm -hmm. you know, fever used to be an absolute, right, uh, uh, contraindication. Um, so we, we really looked at the research. We looked at our informatics and build and epic, and we looked at all of this to come together to try to put together a value equation to make it um, – better during this um, flu season. I like your patient and practice because I think part of the patient component is actually patient feedback, if, you know, patient family, you know, patient family oh, communities. Absolutely. Having that patient actually being active in what's happening. We have something called PFAC, which I, everybody has, yeah. yeah. right? But really using them as a tool. I mean, I love that you put absolutely. that in there because I think that's such an important I thing actually added it when we started talking about falls. And the reason we added it with falls is we're working with Patty Dykes to potentially bring in the awesome. TIPS yeah. program to UMass. I'm really hoping that that will happen sooner rather than later because we're, we're all kinds of falls. Um, but one of the things that Patty would tell you is that even after implementing a program like that, if the patient and family isn't engaged, like mm -hmm. they don't get mm -hmm. that right. they're at higher right. risk for falling right. just yeah. because they came into the hospital. I get that you're a 50-something-year-old on the outside and you play softball on the weekends, but you're deconditioned, you're sick, you're, you're in an unfamiliar environment, you are at higher risk of fall. So having that patient component, I think, to anything that we do um, is really, really important. I totally fall in the hospital. Yeah. I'm gonna damn do it myself. I fall at home. I know. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, the other, the other thing I'm thinking about. So my, my background includes consulting, and consulting is all about methodologies and structure. Right. I can't live without having a methodology to follow to sell work. That's how you lived in uh, the consulting world. But my teams are re resonating with this idea of um, calling it techie, technology enabled quality improvement. So it's using technology. It's not relying on the technology. It's not driving it. It's technology-enabled quality improvement. And you can see it falls through this cycle that looks very familiar, right? It's the same type of system development or solution development, agile, whatever you want to call it. They all sort of follow the same uh, pathway. I will say, I'm not going to go through all of these just in the interest of time. Research is research. The innovation cycle, we've had IDEO here before at uh, NENIC. Oh, Do you guys know what you've seen? You knew well they had IDEO. NENIC. We, we had, had them way back when they came into the thing. Oh, it might have been Oh, it might have been. But the thing I love I about the I IDEO might have sort of... Bring them. We had a one-year engagement with mm -hmm. IDEO. Yeah. Fascinating. Just finished. Right. This is the company, if you haven't seen them, they have the video. I use it in my class with informatics. They have the video where they... Um, uh, 60 Minutes asked them to redesign a shopping cart, and IDEO just thinks outside the box. That's the whole whole thing. And the thing I love that really resonates, whoops, I keep going the wrong way, Mary, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, Your thing is really around design thinking. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's thinking outside the box. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Who would have thought of that but a 19-year-old <laughs> who's not supposed to be <laughs> but like a middle light, yeah. right? But you think about these innovations that pop up or these ideas. For us with flu, um, what we've learned, the innovation that happened with influenza this year was um, we made a game out of it, right? They've done this at Leahy, mm -hmm. we brought it to UMass, and you, you made it a game and a competition between units, and guess what happened? Our rates are just like through the roof now. Mm -hmm. we're, we're screening and vaccinating like um, nobody's business, but it's the bug report. The Monday bug report comes out, right? And the, the team that has done the best or the most improvement gets candy delivered to the floor because they won the bug report for that for that week. So not crazy innovation. This guy's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought of that? Not Shark Tank. <laughs> Never gonna buy that. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know that our current 
you know, folks that look at informatics necessarily see us as innovators, right? That's a, another thing I think we really need to uh, work on. I think if they think of us because of our implementation work as very structured, follow the recipe kind of uh, folks, right? Maybe, maybe strategic, maybe leadership is in there, but I don't know that they necessarily think of us as the outside the box thinkers and the inno innovators. We have to change that because I think one of the challenges, I really do. I think this is one of the the biggest issues is that in the magnet model, you have innovation. But informatics is either embedded in innovation, yep. and it's not there. And it, re I think, it ripples out to the role of the CNIO yeah. everywhere. And I can remember, you know, doing being, you know, the, we were at level six in 2010, I think 2011, and people like I can remember getting I writing a paper, and one of the people reviewing it, another group, she says, "What's CPU?" <laughs> I mean, I remember this like yesterday, and it was. But I think that magnet. Um, that it's still an awkward yeah. relationship. It, it, it fits within the innovation piece, yeah. but it's not embraced. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's just another little area. Yeah, and you know, maybe we need to align. Maybe, yeah, maybe informatics so. needs to align a little bit closer with, um, yeah, with that. Not so. to give up anything that we sort of hold as true, but to maybe look at modernizing a little or collaborate, bit. collaborate, yeah. I'm not going to go through this the PDSA, just sort of in the interest of the time. You guys all know this. Um, the guiding principles for techie, and we do a lot of techies. So flu is one, falls is another. Techies are uh, projects that are technology-enabled quality. The reason they're technology-enabled is like for flu example, as example, we use data visualizations, going back to earlier, right? A green check and the screened column tell you, tells you that your patient was screened. If your patient was not screened, if you clicked unsure uh, or postpone, then that stays as a red X in the screen column, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty simple logic. Mm -hmm. The next column right next to it, and this is on my list in Epic, right next to it is the um, vaccinated in sort of in parentheses if indicated. So you actually get a green check if you vaccinated the patient because they were due, but you also get a green check if they were vaccinated at CVS this flu yeah. season before. Mm -hmm. So the logic actually is sophisticated enough to look. So if you got a red X, um, you know, something's missing. And what we do is we line that up with the, um, the active discharge order. So we know all of our discharges happen between 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, and we just have somebody monitoring that continuously. So as soon as that, that little green dot indicating the discharge order was just written, we look to see if we got two green checks. If we don't, if we, if we do, we're good, move on to the next patient. If we don't, we call up. What's going on? When, when's the uh, flow coordinator going to do to get this patient vaccinated or screened if, if necessary? Um, so all of techie, all of our work that we're trying to do from a quality improvement perspective is really grounded in STEEP, which is the safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable. I add evidence-based. The, the IOM doesn't, believe it or not, have um, IOM uh, evidence-based as part of their uh, criteria, but I think it's an important one. So really when we think about any initiative that we roll out as part of STEEP, it's sort of grounded in this um, principle of STEEP. I love acronyms. <laughs> lean, uh, UMass, one of the things I will say, UMass has always been a very um, sort of lean-focused organization. Our, our uh, CEO is a physician who is internationally recognized for his work around lean. Every employee at UMass, whether you're in housekeeping or nursing or anywhere, goes through lean training uh, day, week one of uh, employment. So, and then we have black belts and all that throughout the organization. But it's a very um, much embedded within the uh, system. I won't read this to you. This is a, actually, this is a great chart. Um, I worked with somebody to make this to talk about lean uh, waste opportunities, but with healthcare examples, because sometimes folks have a hard time translating um, you know, inventory, although that's an easy one, uh, in healthcare, um, you know, what, what does that mean? What does it mean having inventory? We have, I can tell you, we have a huge inventory problem. I cannot tell you how many times I see us throwing away things that have expired off the of shelves in mm -hmm. uh, organization, right? How much cost is yeah. wasted just yeah. because we don't pull from the back, we pull from the front, mm -hmm. right? So just a good, another good thing to be thinking of in terms of our concepts. PDSA, I'm sure a lot of you do this. We've had multiple conversations, but um, even with flu, we're still PDSA in right now because we have just behaviors that occur that you could not possibly have thought of, right? So you have to PDSA it continuously to make sure that you're uh, fine-tuning the product. Um, so surveillance systems, this is on Hamilton up in Canada. This is sort of what's the next, and surveillance systems are systems that sit on top of the data are constantly monitoring. They were able to, over a long period, uh, almost a decade, uh, 16 
yeah, a decade, uh, decrease code blues from 400 to, five to 54 within their organization. How they do that? It's basically looking at the analytics and say, what are the precursors? And the reason why the data set's so long is you need the data to inform. It's almost that wisdom again, right? Yeah. You need the data to show what are those little slight variables that happen that you can't quite figure out. They figured it out. There's another hospital in Orange County, California. I don't know if we've had them at NENIC. Um, they've eliminated inpatient cardiac arrest in their um, pediatric facility, completely eliminated it through wow. surveillance um, mm -hmm. systems. That's the whole failure to rescue, right? Yeah. That whole concept of failure to rescue. Um, artificial intelligence, we can spend a lot of time talking about this. This is one of HIMSS is laser focused on. Um, if you were at annual conference last year, you saw Google stating blatantly that they are going to get into this space. Their vision is that when a physician is in an exam room with a patient, there's an Alexa-like device. That device is listening to the entire conversation. The physician leaves the exam room and doesn't do a thing. The prescriptions print, the documentation's written, <laughs> and it's, it's just there. We're not that far away from it. Alexa's already turning my lights on and off, right? <laughs> um, and Alexa really can be, or Google, whatever the mm -hmm. Google version is, can be, um, can be doing that. There's also a group of facilities down south that from a patient experience perspective have put Alexa-like devices in the rooms, mm -hmm. um, increase the temperature, call the nurse, uh, turn on the TV. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. I had, was at a conference where they were um, presenting. What do you think the number one request was? So down south, Alexa, in rooms. Air conditioning. No. no. Tea? No. Sweet tea? No. <laughs> Alexa, play gospel music. Oh. Oh. <laughs> We're actually just getting ready to uh, getting ready to implement kiosks at the entrances to get oh. with uh, not uh, Alexa, maybe Siri. I'm not really sure yeah. which voice activated NLP they're using, but um, to give directions. Yeah. Tell yeah. them exactly where the cafeteria is or oh, neat. Okay. physical therapy. Or, yeah. That's so just be a verbal oh. communication as opposed yeah. to I mean, we account. do we have wayfinding apps that people can download, but this is, would be even one step further. Yeah. 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 Mark, how did they go around the hippo teeth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, this um, first of all, these can be on your network, right? So they're protected from the network from that. The Alexa? Huh? The Alexa? But doesn't some yeah. of the data live up in the cloud? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because that's where we... Um, we got oh, on. I know. We, we found that the Apple iPhones, if you use the um, native messaging, that message goes up to the cloud at some point, yeah. so it couldn't be used for internal texting right. data. You know that it is being used for internal texting every single day, right? Yeah. I, I don't need to tell you. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it, it, it was, this was, they, they were hospital phones. Yeah, okay. But that they had, we tried, then we went to Cortex yeah. messaging because okay. that was secure. Secure but, messaging. But yeah. they were like, technically, it's out of oh, absolutely. for a while, so yeah. you are violating HIPAA yeah. privacy. The one stood down south, the patient had to, you know, authorize whatever oh, okay. Okay. Um, they, they were doing with it. Some would argue, and there's been debates that came up at the HIMSS board meeting, that, you know, HIPAA, if you remember, it's for treatment, payment, healthcare mm -hmm. operations. So changing the temperature in the room, that's operations, right? That yeah. falls within, so that's, that's, a, that's an appropriate use. Um, the listening, the constant listening and yeah. the conversations that take place. That's yep. that's where we get yep. kind of stuck. Yeah, that's where they give the patient the opt-out. So you don't have to have Alexa. You don't have to use it, mm -hmm. right? So you opt, you can opt out. Most patients got opt-in. That's the thing is they really, they want, they control. want, they want, yeah, want they want yeah, they want the yeah. control. And they do, just, yeah. they've like lost care. We have, a, we, we we have, have a EICU. We you may have yep. some, too. Mm -hmm. we, we monitor 110 beds in our system alone and then additional outside. That's the yeah, the Office of General Counsel said no. Really? Can you comment on when, in your opinion, when it steps over the boundary of the OR? An FDA product? So, AI, if you actually read, and I've done a lot of reading on this topic, any decision, any two data sets that then makes an assumption associated with a um, treatment or implementation or alteration on a plan, according to the FDA, is subject to FDA. Mm -hmm. And yet, as we move forward, I just came from the HIMSS Big Data Conference yep. that was here in Boston for two days. There was not one discussion about at what point do these processes or products yep. step over that line where FDA approval is 
Yeah, yeah that's, a good, that's a really good question. So I go, think, and, go and read the yeah. regs. Because yeah. then will, does the FDA want to take it on? Yeah, that's the problem. The FDA have the doesn't want so yeah. yeah. No, I would suggest to you under this administration, they don't have the uh, bandwidth. Oh, right, right. So, they, but, so they're not looking for more yeah. regulation. And they the technologies are ahead of the regulation. Sure mm -hmm. yeah. No, but it's a really good question because uh, we are seeing more and more devices, right? You think, mm -hmm. you think about the Internet of Things and mm -hmm. all these devices. That we, and where, where do you draw the line? Is a Fitbit an FDA device, right? Mm -hmm. Is my, my wife has those headphones that you know don't go in your ears; they vibrate. You know, so and so how how does that work? And are those medical devices? Yeah, the new EKG that's coming out on the Apple Watch. Yeah, yeah. So you know that I've been I spend most of my time before and after hospitalization and data that's collected and. <laughs> How are we going to somehow integrate that into the, the EMR? Yep. And so all of these um, products that are being, I'm going to just be very broad, all these products that are being developed to collect data before and after hospitalization, at what point, just from a very basic level about the quality of the, of the data, yep. do we need to make sure that this product is FDA approved yep. to even know that, that blood pressure is a, a valid. But it reminds, it reminds me of the early days of the EMR, like in the 90s. I mean, there were there were so many different solutions. And none of them some were certified. None of them were certified. <laughs> right. Some of them were half baked. Yeah. Some of them were vaporware. And, you know, and, and I think we're exactly right. Well, no, I mean, the, we're at that stage with these kind of consumer yeah. wearables, and yeah. they're going to explode. I mean, the the you know the hockey stick curve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was one of my two different yeah. things. Yeah. One, yeah. The, uh, the Apple Watch. They have. Uh, there's a study going on at Stanford, Stanford HeartWatch. If you can look it up, it's kind of interesting. They've partnered together and they're, they're doing some research with that. The other thing is I had a student, and her uh, research was getting two conversational agents to talk to each other, so Siri and Alexa. <laughs> 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 oh, that's a brilliant story. I know. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> For, for this is Alexa Children's Boston, by the way. They, they're actually using it right here in Boston, um, another example. Substance at John Hopkins, they again developed their own version of this. Again, sort of where we're headed, right? No more about the implementation. Now it's about data and things that we can be doing to um, improve and intervene quicker, uh, et cetera. This was the flu work at Leahy. You see the green check, the red X. Um, again, for Leahy, um, we moved from 69% uh, during the 2015 flu season to 98%, and that that one metric from one payer was a check for $800,000 from Blue Cross of Mass because we were able to show that much of an improvement in our inpatient influenza, and that translated for them to uh, decrease readmissions, decrease, et cetera. So we got a check for $800,000 that was attributed, attributed all the way back to nursing uh, informatics for the work that we did there. So that's the value. I'm not going to go through this. It's a great change slide. The way you read it is the bottom is the, um, the blue checks. You need those blue checks to get lasting change. In the absence of a blue check, you can see with each of the red circles what happens over to the right if you don't have it. So without leadership commitment, you get anxiety and frustration mm -hmm. from the uh, rank and file. This has held true for me throughout my entire career. I would like to throw it in because change is tough. Um, it was really tough at UMass when we put in uh, Epic. I'm sure it's tough in your organizations as well. But you really do need to make sure that you have uh, lasting change. One of the most important or most overlooked is the last column, the uh, performance measures. Uh, are, are we doing, did we get our money's worth out of that $700 million or, or not? Or what was the number for partners, one point something right. million? In the bill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was it with a B? Yeah. You know, so what are those performance measures? How, you know, did, did we yeah. get what we uh, needed uh, from the system? Have we improved quality, et cetera? Should that be included in the bill? If you, if you, would you, how much do you include in the bill? Because we're looking at a new EMR. Yeah. I'm a test medical center. Yeah. And we're, you know, Absolutely. waiting for. Should be in your contract with the vendor. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it should be in contract with the vendor. Yeah, you, should, I agree. you should hold the vendor accountable to some of those as well because it's not just the workflows around it, it's the technology as well plays some role in it. So having those performance measures, um, if they were doing it right, they would have a total cost of ownership model. That, yeah. That's where all of those are defined and say, yep, we're gonna, it's going to take us 20 years to pay this back, but yeah. this is how we're going to pay it back. I support that. So what always happens is that that's why we have so many problems with reports. Right. Because reports get pushed off, pushed off, pushed off to the end. And you start to build them and say, oh, we can't do that. And then it's too expensive to do it because you have to go rework the database yeah. or the data isn't in the database. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, and, and it's very hard to get, uh, I, I mean, in my experience, it's very hard. 
um, other than what's already known in terms of performance measures, right. it's very hard to get people to conceptualize. But the good thing about all these different systems is that you have so many peers in the community. They can tell you this is, you know, and especially mm -hmm. I always say when I would retire, these are my three goals. I want never to talk about restraints. I want never to talk about. <laughs> yes. I want yes. never to talk about um, slips and falls, and I want every nurse to get to lunch and go to the bathroom twice a day. 